swing pass. We're going, going back, back to Cali. Cali with the announcement of Pavel Giannis's six-year contract with the Los Angeles Aviators. Now, Los Angeles did not make the playoffs in 2022 or 2021. In fact, the last time LA made the postseason was in 2019. The West Division looked completely different back then. We <laughs> added three expansion teams in 2022 in Colorado, Salt Lake, and Portland. They have manifestly changed the landscape, but now the league's all-time leading assist getter, completion thrower, kind of one of the faces of the league the past half decade, joins the Aviators and completely, again, just reshapes what I think we expect from this division going into 2023. Daniel, what are your first thoughts with Giannis now moving to LA? I mean, you came into this league with the Chicago organization. You've <laughs> been around that guy for years. What What is this like? What does this mean for LA? <laughs> it's, it's weird. Uh, just looking at that jersey swap image of him in an LA jersey, I still can't wrap my head around it. Uh, seeing it in person on the field, I'm sure will be just a, an entire different flood of emotions. But it's it's obviously exciting for LA. Also, a six year deal. We've never seen anything that length in the AUDL history, as far as we yeah. know. We think three years is probably the previous high. Which also, Pavel did sign a three year contract with Chicago. Uh, a couple other guys signed those as well. I think Nate Goff is maybe in the third year of his three year deal as well. But six years is kind of unheard of for our sport. That's like half of our league's history. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. I am still just kind of going through uh, my thoughts and initial reactions, but props to LA. I mean, I I'm curious to see if there's any sort of bidding war between LA and San Diego. Once the news came out that Papa was going to move to California, LA is a, a fun spot for him to land in just because they've, they've kind of developed this younger core of guys offensively that, haven't had like a ton of structure to their offense, but have been playing with the best teams in the West, really, even while they haven't been making the playoffs. So I, I'm just excited to see what this does to their offense and honestly their defense too. Like lining up against Pavel every single practice now, you assume the defense is going to get better from that. So yeah, just really excited to see what's going to happen. I mean, to your last point about kind of the, the second order or third order changes, obviously introducing a passer, the skill of Giannis to any team is going to make them a playoff contender, let alone maybe a championship weekend dark horse. But I think to sure. your point about what he offers in like a practice environment, I mean, we've heard those stories for years from Chicago about how regimented and disciplined Chicago practices came up. Uh, he came underneath the regime of Pavel. And you just got to figure that stands to benefit LA in the same ways where they've been playing well. They're a scrappy bunch. But I, I think back to your article about hybrid types. Los mm -hmm. Angeles's offense for the past couple of years has been filled with what you considered, I think, like glue guys. Yeah. Sort of not necessarily anchoring in, in the backfield, not necessarily always upfield as a re mm -hmm. receiver, kind of playing that mid-range game. And you saw that a lot from LA last year. I mean, obviously they have Brandon Van Dusen, a candidate for most improved player in 2022. He led the team in assists, raw throwing completions, huck completions. He was a great long distance thrower. But other than that, they kind of got things done through a collective effort. You saw Aaron Weaver around the disc a lot, Michael Keoy, Marcel Osborne, Sam Cook, the rookie Everest Shapiro. Everyone kind of showed an ability with the disc, but they, they've they never had a thrower like Pavliana center team. Yeah. I mean, no one but Chicago has, to be quite frankly, but he just brings a different gravity to this offense. And I was wondering if you could kind of maybe walk through what you expect him to do, if you expect him to kind of slot in as what he was in Chicago, where he was that QB one, that that absolute fulcrum balance point for the offense, or if you think he might adapt into a slightly new role, if you think he might become a more hybrid type in LA's offense. I guess what I'm asking is, do you think Pavel becomes more like an aviator, or do you think the aviators become more like Pavel's? I think the most likely situation is he slots into a pretty similar role that he was in in Chicago, and that they kind of build an offense around this central quarterback who's commanding touches. Like, no one on the Aviators was really a super high-volume thrower last season. Van Dusen, I think, completed 
450 throws, but you know, Pavel's been in like the 600 plus range each of the last five years. Uh, so they really haven't had anyone like him before. And I think it just makes the most sense given his experience, given his like veteran leadership too, just having that be the guy with the disc in his hands more often than not. But I, you know, we're kind of seeing this current trend of like the best players in the league, like Jordan Kerr, Ryan Osgar, Austin Taylor with Atlanta. Like that's probably the best example of putting those guys downfield a little bit more to at least start possessions and having them throw out of a, an initiating cutter position, which I don't think Chicago tried a ton with Pavel. Obviously, he's so comfortable in that backfield set, and he's such a sure thing with the disc that it makes a lot of sense for him to be commanding touches. But he is also just an extremely talented ultimate player, really all around. And when you get guys that are cutting initially and then can launch hucks out of that stack, that it's like the more likely huck opportunities are created from that situation rather than like a standstill quarterback, uh, a pocket passer in the backfield. So I think like the general concept of, of getting more motion involved in the offense seems to be good in, in producing results for teams. So I, at this point, like if I were LA, I would kind of approach this team with a blank slate, like scrap everything that you've seen from the team over the last couple of years. You have this new roster, you've got this, absolute stud and star in Pavel that you could put in the backfield, but you could try him out downfield. And I think Van Dusen also gives you a lot to work with. Like he is a much more aggressive deep thrower or has been historically. And so, you know, maybe you lean into that, but maybe you like scale everything back and just make it a more conservative offense. I think they're going to have a lot of fun just trying out these different pieces in different places. So it's really a, a spot where I, I could see some experimentation, especially early on in the season. You know, I think you made a terrific point a moment ago, and it really tethers to something I was thinking about listening to one of Pavel's old interviews. You mentioned him becoming such a great all-around player, and there's an interview from 2019 All-Star Weekend where Evan Lepler asked Pavel about being, quote-unquote, the best thrower in the league, what that's like, etc. And Pavel actually talks about how it's a little bit of an uh, insult to him to be called <laughs> such a pure passer, yeah. to be considered an all-star thrower. He said specifically he is trying to become the best all-around playmaker and player he can be. And I think this move really kind of gives him a new lease on being able to fulfill mm -hmm. the standards he set for himself. I think with the Union, that franchise is so much built off and around him that he was such a central nucleus that it was kind of hard for him to shift much outside of his role. Everything was contingent on what Giannis was already providing to their offense. And I think... With the move to the Aviators, you might see a freeing up of what you're saying. Maybe he gets upfield a little bit more, starts initiating upfield, starts showing a little bit more of that mobility we saw this last year from him when he scored a career high in goals. You know, he, yeah. I think one of the more subtle ways in which he has evolved as a player is what you were talking about a moment ago. He's no longer a pocket passer. When he came into this league, it was basically Pavel trying to get into power position and boost it to Ross Barker downfield or uh, Jimmy Pardo. And nowadays, it's almost like this, this different small ball game where he's looking to kill you with a thousand paper cuts. I feel like his huck numbers continue to go down. His aggressiveness with the disc continues to go down. But his effectiveness as a player just continues to push higher and higher. And you saw that this last year as Chicago made it all the way to their first championship game. And I, I can't help but think that's going to be a similar sort of raising the bar expectation for Giannis in LA, where he's just going to want to see where they're at, gauge them now, and just continue to mark off increasements, almost like you do when you're uh, measuring your height at home as a kid. You know, you're just, <laughs> it's slow, it's incremental, but all of a sudden it just starts to add up. I've, I've just seen Giannis's work and it's the cumulative effect of it just takes such power. And I, I really think that he has a terrific opportunity in LA, but transitioning kind of what he can do for LA I feel like the almost bigger question now is what the heck happens in the west like what does this mean for the rest of the team you know we were talking about this a little bit beforehand I feel like Colorado especially with their re-signings and the expected uh consistency of their roster that made the semifinals in their first year in 2022 will largely be the same and they figure to be another superpower this year they're returning Jonathan Nethercutt, Alex Atkins. They announced this morning the re-signing of Cody Spicer, the 2022 Defensive Player of mm. the Year. I think the summit are set. Yeah, they, they've got a lot of good players. Uh, real real quick, last note on Pavel. 
I think whatever oh, yeah. role we see him in, uh, his red zone involvement, like I think he's one of the best red zone handlers in the league. So even if he is in more of a hybrid type role, I think especially as they close in towards the end zone, the Aviators were a bottom 10 team in the league last year in red zone conversion rate. And last two I, years. Yeah, last two years. Right. So like that's, and I feel like that's kind of been a struggle for all the teams out West as, as in addition to like all around consistency. So I fully expect him to be like the guy taking charge in the red zone too, which would be huge. Um, but anyway, back to Colorado. Yeah, I, I think Colorado is, to me, still the clear-cut favorite in the West. Where LA slots in behind that, though, like San Diego and Salt Lake, I would say they're the favorites for the second two playoff spots still. But Salt Lake had a lot of a lot of variance with them, like a lot of inconsistency, yeah. some really bad like thirty plus turnover were... games. They were an expansion team playing in the West. It, yeah. It bears to mention that. I know Colorado sure, looks sure. so much different, but they had Jonathan Nethercutt and Jay Frood leading their charge. Salt right. Lake had Jordan Kerr, who had played one season in this league. You know, Joe Merrill, who was fantastic. J- Jacob yeah. Miller, fantastic captains. Like, no no criticism of their leadership style, but, like, those were some young bucks. I remember us yeah. talking extensively about <laughs> – they did so well in their rookie seasons, but what can we expect as team leaders going into their first year at the shred? And they, I think, exceeded all expectations, but they're, they're absolutely right. They were so variable. Yeah, they're very, very, they're still, and they're still very young, right? Like they don't have a ton of like these experienced AUDL vets, if any, at this point. And because Pavel is coming into a situation in the West where like a lot of these teams are just kind of. I don't know, we've, we've referred to it as like West Ball before. It's just generally like higher turnover games. And so if Pablo can just bring a little bit more stability to one team in the West, that could be enough. Like maybe they catch Salt Lake on a, a high variance week for Salt Lake where they're just throwing stuff up and turning the disc over a lot. Or maybe it's a really windy game where you see the importance of like possession throwers accentuated that much more. Like, Cal- or sorry, Pavel with LA, I think gives them the potential to just be a little bit more consistent to become a playoff team. And San Diego is kind of similar in a different way with their inconsistency. Like obviously they have a much older, much more veteran roster, but it just wasn't always panning out with like the, the roles you were seeing different guys in and really putting it all together offensively and defensively. Haven't seen it a ton from them. I mean, they still... They'd still tend to figure it out later in the season. But again, maybe that's something Pavel and LA can take advantage of earlier in the season when they meet, uh, you know, in the first few weeks of the season like they normally do. Because LA and San Diego always play each other close. So that almost feels like even more of a toss-up this year with Pavel joining the Aviators. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think the point about consistency is an especially apt one. You know, San Diego, I think, has made a ton of hay in the past three seasons. They're, they're two championship weekend appearances in 2019 and 2021. And then their playoff appearances last year. They've gone to now, I think, five straight postseasons. Something Did like they that. they make it in 2018? Yeah. Either four or five or five straight. And I think oh, with yeah. that, it, obviously the record is consistency, but their play has been consistent. They have mm-hmm. been, over the past five seasons, I would say, easily the most consistently performing franchise in that division. You look at every yeah. other team in the West who has existed that long, they're seven wins one year, they're three wins the next, they're nine yeah. wins the next year. You know, <laughs> Aviators being a prime example of this. They made right. Championship right. Weekend in 2018. They, they fared pretty well in 2019. 2021 was a down year. 2022, they they struggled at times, but they stayed competitive. They were dealing with injuries. Like there's to have consistency in the West right now, I think is sort of a philosopher's stone. It just gives you a little bit more knowledge as to what to expect in the week in, week out churn, which again, this professional schedule isn't something that all players are accustomed to playing with coming out of the tournament tournament structure of college Mm -hmm. and amateur divisions in the sport and so I think that week in that week out just knowing what to expect knowing what our discipline is has gone so far and I think that you're absolutely right Giannis bringing that into the aviators is just going to give them uh, a intangible that I think is so elusive in this division there's so much talent and that's and that's kind of where I want to get to the the second half of how this will affect the west 
if LA stays the same as last year, I don't know if the Pavel addition by itself is enough. I think if KJ Koo and Calvin Brown can come back from injuries and play a relatively full season, they have the kind of playmaking potential to really elevate LA's chances. But Oakland's a young team. They stand to get better. They started 0-5 last year, which really put them in the hole, but they were really impressive in some of their later season performances. They're still working on that consistency thing, but there is talent there. And I know that they're energized going into 2023. Portland had a very disappointing inaugural season, but it stands to reason that they will bounce back a little bit more in season two, have some more defensive principles, kind of gird some of the ways in which they would just let games get away from them. Mm -hmm. And then the other three teams that are going to be competing with LA made the playoffs last year are kind of like perennial playoff teams. I know Colorado has only existed for a season, but they've got so much championship experience on that roster. It it doesn't really feel like a second year team. And, And that's where I start to circle back in on Salt Lake. I think that they're talented. I also think that they rode a ton of emotion in their first year, all those big home crowds from game one in Salt Lake. It's the the energy that they had and like you could just feel it with their d-line play they love to get out and counterattack you they didn't mind the errors and the turnovers they mm-hmm. were gonna beat you in terms of kind of almost vibes like they're just gonna run you harder they're gonna make the bigger highlight plays they're gonna seize that momentum yeah does that magic continue this year and does that work against an opponent who has a player like pavel who's just going to to borrow a quote from madison head coach tim debile Well, if you build a wall, Pavel is just going to punch it down. Like he doesn't go around it. He doesn't go underneath it. He just punches it down. And I just, I see him encountering the West division this year like that. And I think that's going to be a big problem for everyone else in the West. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, yeah, best case scenario for LA is that that Pavel mentality trickles down to the rest of their team and kind of begins to build the identity of that roster where we haven't really seen that from other teams in the West, maybe save for Colorado and San Diego. So yeah, I, th- I think that's best case scenario. Worst case scenario would be that Pavel gets thrown into this, this wild West scenario and just starts hucking it like crazy and, and fits right into whatever Van Dusen's been doing the past couple of seasons. I'm also curious just to, just to think out loud for a second. I haven't heard any rumors, but every year we see a good amount of movement between San Diego and LA back and forth, whatever team is expected to be better. We'll see a few players start gravitating. I, I got to think the Pavel signing is going to be a, a pretty big factor in swaying some people's decisions. Sean McDougal notably, and we had him on for an interview last year. He, I think he lives like right between LA and San Diego. So I would, I would love that. I would love the the McDougal to Giannis connection in LA just to further balance the competitive landscape. I think, like you said, if they can get just one or two like more big name additions or or re signings, like you mentioned, Ku and Calvin Brown, this this team is going to have the star power necessary to really ascend to playoff potential. And I just think it gets back to this thing of the parity that's developing in this league, right? Like. There isn't a whole bunch of talent discrepancy between some of these teams. It's more about that consistency of lineup, the consistency of performance, what kind of your right. structuring is, the coaches and and yeah. your lineups and your rotations. And it just feels like this is going to be such a good laboratory example of what happens, you know, when you, when you bring in a star and, and yeah. you get to kind of watch all of those elements play out. Like he brings such a different flair from what the rest of the West has been. Just, before. yeah, the divisional difference there is going to be so <laughs> interesting to watch. It's like, I don't, I don't know if you could think of a more extreme example. Really, any any of the other three divisions paired with the West is going to be a pretty drastic difference in play style. But I, I feel like, especially with the way the Central has kind of evolved into this like grinded out, a lot of like tough defensive battles, uh, you know, like slowly and slowly lowering those turnover numbers. Yeah, just, just throwing that into to what we've seen from the West. I I can't wait. 
Yeah, I think the aviators, in line with their team theme and with the signing, they need to start going on beaches and doing those like sky riders or the planes with like a banner behind them for recruiting. I mean, yeah, Pavel's been so good Would at recruiting that. in Chicago the past few years. I can't imagine he's going to have trouble on the beach in LA. But yeah, well, he's got he's got six years to build this team too. So the recruiting might be he might be playing the long game a bit as well. Six years, time. six years. So we were talking about this before the episode. Six <laughs> years ago at this time. Dallas is coming off of a perfect season and winning the championship in 2016 in their inaugural <laughs> That was year. so long ago. Yeah. The MVP yeah. that year was Dylan Tunnell. Dylan Tunnell was the reigning MVP. He played in 2021, but he hasn't really played much <laughs> since like 2018. Yeah. Uh, Toronto and Madison were the unquestioned division champs of East and Central, respectively. I mean, they had years of just yeah. dominate every those season. Teams. Yeah. Those teams. Madison hasn't sifted the playoffs since 2018. Toronto is in the middle of a massive rebuild after half of their established players and legends retired after the 2021 season. Like it, it, it it's, I can't even begin to try to think about. <laughs> there's no, there's no like, guessing like, no, yeah, where, where concept. the league will be at in six years. I have no concept. How many more titles will New York have won in six years? <laughs> well, Two? Pavel will tell you zero. Pavel will tell us zero. Well, we'll be sure to keep you all abreast as more news and information continues to break out. But this is obviously kind of the big lightning strike in the middle of the offseason. I think really gets everything propelling towards 2023. You can just feel all the signings coming together. There's a little bit more buzz. And Daniel and I will be here every week to break it down for you. We hope to see you next week. It's Swing Pass. 